We start shooting this Saturday. We put out sort of a national casting call. We said, number one, you need to be an elite player. If you're the best guy among your 12 friends, this show's probably not for you. This is where you have to be like, I'm one step away from playing professionally. Not the best guy in the court, not even the best guy in that court all the time. It's the best guy in your city. Hi, I'm Crystal Brown, your host. Have you ever had the dream of becoming a professional pickleball player? What about owning a Pickleball Kingdom facility? Well, that's exactly what a lucky few pickleball players will win on the new reality series, Pickleball Paddle Battle. Ace Rodriguez, the founder of Pickleball Kingdom, gives us a behind the scenes look into his vision for the show, his amazing courts and facility, and the future of the kingdom. All right, now to the show. Welcome to Simply Pickleball, the podcast where we discuss all things pickleball, the fastest growing sport in America and around the world. We are interviewing the founders, industry leaders, athletes, lovers of the sport that are driving the spectacular growth. If you love pickleball as much as we do, listen in. All right. Well, Ace, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really excited to learn about the reality show you're putting on, Pickleball Battle Battle. But I first want to get into a little bit about you and your backstory. I know you grew up in Hawaii. So before we get into pickleball, tell me about your background in business. You are clearly an ambitious person. So uh, what brought you to Arizona and what were you doing prior to Pickleball uh, kingdom. Yeah. Well, thanks, Crystal. Thanks for having me on. And I love talking about pickleball kingdom. So we'd be happy to share the story. Number one, I've always been an athlete. So I love sports. And when I did get into business, I literally felt like business is sports minus the ball. So it did seem like a natural transition for me. My wife and I are both from Hawaii and we had a financial services business. So that's what brought us out to Arizona about 25 years or so ago. So we've been here for a while, you know, consider this home. We get back to Hawaii every year. So, you know, see our family and friends and expanded that business, grew it to um, offices in three states, sold that business, did a couple of other things. In terms of pickleball, like a lot of people, I heard about it through friends. And at first it sounded cool, but then I, I was a little suspicious because why were these friends like obsessed? You know, they were just like, they went from we tried this thing to we're playing every night. And I thought, that's crazy. I, I don't understand. But finally, one night during COVID, uh, I finally took them up on it. So kind of went kicking and screaming. Crystal, in the first five minutes, I literally raised my arms and said, greatest sport ever. So you were an athlete. So you were obviously playing other sports during this time. Right. And did you think the greatest sport ever in terms of for yourself, because clearly you took it to a different level with the business or were you thinking, Oh my gosh, this is going to be the greatest business sport ever. You know, what, what were you thinking? No, I'll, I'll be honest. I wish I was that intentional at the time. I had that <laughs> master plan. It wasn't a business issue at all. It was purely as a sport. A million years ago, I played football at the University of Hawaii. So as a quarterback, I screwed up my knees. So till today, I still deal with knee problems, back problems. Uh, my daughter, when she was young, would always say, Dad, you're so frail. You know, when we uh, kind of wrestle around a little bit. I say, sweetie, my body's been through a lot. And so I kind of still have those uh, war wounds, if you will. And so when I was on the pickleball court, the reason I think I got so attracted to it is I was able to push myself and really uh, try hard where I haven't done that for maybe a decade, you know, because I had to give up pickup basketball and it was just too tough. So here's something I could go all out, be super competitive. I love ping pong and I felt like I'm standing on a giant ping pong table. So for all those elements is why I said it was the greatest sport ever. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've thought about that before. Um, is it, you know, I, I was a competitive athlete also growing up and I've mentioned this before in an episode that I really never wanted to compete post-college. I, I just, I wasn't that interested. I didn't want to push my body to hurt it. Um, and now I can't wait to push myself competitively. Um, you know, I want to get better every day, which I think a lot of pickleball players do. So you started playing and then when was this moment where you thought, okay, I'm going to translate this into business um, because I do think you're right, by the way, a lot of, of really nice parallels between sports and business. Yeah. You know, there's a seed of truth to every cliche. And so during that time, when I first got into pickleball, I kept hearing old man sport, you know, retired sport. And there's a seed of truth to that. And 
I lived it, even though I'd like to say my age isn't there, but my body was. So retired people really got attracted to pickleball because it is uh, less intense on the body. You can play at whatever level you want. And so I think that's the big appeal. That's the big attraction. Secondly, I think, Crystal, that pickleball has exploded because the learning curve is so short and it's so social. So typically you're playing in pairs. The four of you are usually never more than about 20 to 30 feet apart. So a lot of dialogue, a lot of smack talking, you know, just that's part of the fun. And you can really have a good time together. So I instantly started getting other guys into it. So I just bought some paddles, you know, cheap paddles, you know, online that everyone gets at first. It's really not much more than wood. And uh, I would tell guys, you don't need to bring anything. Just come on out. I would get 15 to 20 guys to show up. We do a little round robin, you know, brought a speaker, played some music just for fun. And where, just, to, just for context, where, where, where was this? Was it at the end of your street? Did you have courts? No, no. It was just on a public uh, park called Arrowhead Park here in Chandler, Arizona. So converted tennis courts. And so that was kind of the problem. So the fourth time I did this, it was January 9th of 2021 and loved the sport, saw all the great things about it. But at this point I saw the downside, you know, and the downsides were number one, you can't reserve a court. Number two, the courts are filthy. They never get cleaned unless it rains. And even then it's not raining, uh, washing everything off of it. It's hot, it's cold. And as you know, Crystal, once you start playing, probably the biggest problem is the wind. You know, because a pickleball is a wiffle ball, like people can see in your background. Uh, By design, it's meant to be affected by wind. So to play outdoors, it's crazy. And we're in Arizona, which is not typically windy. So I can't even imagine playing outdoors in most states. Yes, I will tell you, San Francisco has its fair share of problems with the weather. (laughs) So at the end of that fourth time that I'm just talking about, so again, for posterity, January 9, 2021, we're starting to wrap up. There's six courts. I'm kind of leaning on the fence, you know, on one of the middle courts and I look to my left and two of the guys that were with us, their brothers, they have six sons between them. So I'm looking at boys six to about 14, having a great time looking at the courts diagonally across. It's five women doing some kind of round robin. Great time looking straight across. There's three couples doing a, some kind of tournament thing. Great time. Over there, there's a family and their four kids. Great time. These two courts were my guys, 20 to 50 something. Great time. And I said, there's something about this. It's it's not an old man sport. It's not the experience I'm having. It's for everybody. I've never seen anything translate to every ethnicity, every gender, every age, you name it, every athletic level. So that's when the idea struck. I feel like God threw a lightning bolt into my brain and heart. And I thought, well, if this were indoors, all these problems go away. And then the old, you know, the old adage kicks in. What if, what if this were indoors? What if this, what if that? And from that moment on, I couldn't get out of my, out of my head. And just over a year and about three months later, we opened pickleball kingdom here in Chandler. I mean, that's amazing. So I have a few questions about that. I mean, you know, I've, I've worked with a lot of entrepreneurs. I've been an entrepreneur. There's usually a, a, an itch to scratch and you can't ignore it until you take care of it and you start your business. But have you always been like that? I mean, uh, you know, have you always been sort of entrepreneurial in, in spirit? Yeah, I would say so. And, and again, not to keep harping on our sports motif, but as an athlete, I don't think that ever left me, right? A, a true athlete says, coach, give me the ball, you know, let, put the ball in my hands. I was a quarterback. Let me throw the ball. And so uh, I think I, I carry that and still carry that with me that chips are down. You know, I want to impact the game. And so when I see opportunities, I take it. What's interesting about this though, Crystal, I really feel like it's more the the time was right. And it's sort of a, a mission that found me because I wasn't looking for anything, you know? So I've had businesses that I've started that I'm looking for my next thing. Where's an opportunity? What can I put some, whether it's capital or effort into this wasn't one of those things. I wasn't looking to do something else. Wasn't looking to start something, but it just struck me so hard, so fast that there's this 
tsunami of opportunity coming for the person who can figure it out, number one. And then number two, frankly, take the risk. 40,000 times anything is a big number. And so to open up a facility, it does take, you know, take jumping off the deep end. The other part of that is you could have had your site set on opening one facility and it would be a great business and it could be more of a lifestyle business. I imagine maybe even harder than a lifestyle business, but still, um, but you don't, you have your site set on, I've heard you say like Amazon and pickleball. So you know, what's the state of the business right now? And then why do you feel like it should be growing? I live by the mantra, um, crystal, you know, go big or go home. So, um, um, I don't know that I would do something as just maybe a one-off. And so at that moment, I will tell you, January 9th, 2021, standing there on these dirty courts when it's windy and hot, when the idea came, it came fully fleshed out as this was going to be a franchise play. Now, my intent at the time was to build probably five locations here in Arizona and then franchise nationally. But then what happened is the market spoke. And as a business person, I've learned you need to listen to the market, whether it's telling you what you want to hear or not. And so in this case, because starting with the end in mind, I knew I wanted to franchise the, the name, the colors, the way we designed everything. It was with the intent to scale. And so with that, from the day we opened, people would walk in and say, how many other locations are there? Where's the corporate office? I want to buy a franchise. And it, it would be, let me put it this way, Crystal. If today when we're done with the podcast, someone knocks on your door and you open the door and they say, hey, I want to buy your house. How much? You say, it's not for sale. Next day, knock. Different person, want to buy your house, not for sale. Third day, different person, want to buy your house. At some point, you're going to think, hmm, maybe I should put my house on the market. The market is telling me it has an appetite for this. And that's what happened to me. I was planning to franchise probably a couple of years down the line. But because the market was telling me we need to move now, and because of the fact that we started from the jump with the intent to franchise, so we were documenting everything. We were creating a playbook. We call it the Keys of the Kingdom. So we were equipped and ready. And I'm going to tell you, Crystal, we made the mistakes that everyone's going to make. Because you just think, big open space, rent courts, how hard could it be? I literally said those words January 9, 2021. I will answer that question. It's the most difficult thing I've ever done. So <laughs> Extremely difficult, but very gratifying and rewarding. Yeah. So tell me, so what were some of the mistakes you made in the beginning? I mean, everything from not even thinking about how to clean the courts. These are outdoor surfaces. You know, you call the manufacturer and they say, pressure wash it. We're indoors. We can't pressure wash it. Their answer is, oh, okay, we don't know that, you know. It's not our problem. It's outdoor surfaces. So uh, that was a whole fiasco and took a lot of time, frankly, a lot of money to get that figured out. But we have uh, how to reserve courts. The few places I saw out there, they were charging the lowest possible amount they could uh, for a membership and then hitting you with court fees every time you stepped on the court. I just felt like that was like a restaurant that when you ask, hey, can I get some more sour cream? And they say, oh, it's going to be 75 cents more. Now, 75 cents isn't going to break you or I, Crystal, but it's just sort of irritating, right? I'm spending 30 bucks for a plate. Just give me some more sour cream. <laughs> so I didn't want to do that. So I figured, how can we give more value and charge an amount that's fair for the customer and is good for the business so we can survive? Because this isn't a race to the bottom, not for us anyway. And so we had to figure out those things, uh, came up with how to have what's called unlimited reservations never been done before. We made that up. It's now kind of becoming standard industry practice. Um, using the term dedicated indoor uh, pickleball facility, we coined that. Um, just a lot of things like that, that we had to be pioneers because we're staring at a blank page. You know, we had to figure it out. Do you have other franchises in the works now, or is that still sort of future? No. So we have about a dozen locations coming on board right now. We have another 20 that are in queue right behind that, just at different stages of signing their agreement, you know, doing those types of things. We'll be at probably 50 locations inside of our first year. And what's your competition like? I mean, I, I, I know you read articles about pickleball courts in malls and, um, you know, vacant bed, bath and beyond. So are you feeling the pressure or do you feel like there's so much more demand than we can meet anyway that you welcome, welcome the competition? <laughs> uh, there's two ways I can answer that question. Number one, we're at the beginning of the beginning. 
this is when Ray Kroc was telling people fast food and they're saying, well, what do you mean by that? You know, what do you mean you don't get silverware? So I, I think we're at that beginning stages of, of all of this, number one. Number two, Crystal, if you haven't you know, been able to tell so far, I am competitive. So yes, there's room for everyone, but we're going to dominate this marketplace. And we plan on being the uh, the leading brand in indoor pickleball franchising. So, and, and do you think you'll go into other things? Because you, again, the analogy to Amazon, um, I, I know a lot about the early days of Amazon and they, you know, I, I imagine Jeff Bezos had some sites set on things besides books, but he did just go out with books. And so do you have your sites set on other things besides besides uh, the, the indoor pickleball locations? No doubt. Uh, literally and figuratively, pun intended, we have some aces up our sleeve. Um, <laughs> can't really share that right now. But no problem. We're building an infrastructure, and the difference with what we're doing, Crystal, is we're having massive eyeballs in terms of a captive audience with our membership base that we're going to be able to monetize in a very win-win situation where we're providing them services and products they want that's good for the business as well. So yes, I mean, we have sort of a master plan for all of that. All right. So let's jump into the pickleball paddle battle. It's hard to say. It's like a tongue twister. So tell me about when you thought of it and, and maybe just let me know, you know, what is it? What, what can you tell? I know it's a reality show, but beyond that, what is it? So the idea struck me just, you know, sort of like the idea of pickleball kingdom came to me when I wasn't really thinking about it, you know, playing pickleball. In this case, I was listening to a podcast, you know, if I'm not actively doing something, something. If I'm in my car, my shower, uh, I've always got either my phone or a portable speaker. I'm listening to something. So I know I'm preaching to the choir here because your audience. Yes. Is- <laughs> I so, like to hear that. Cannot more fervently recommend, you know, better your mind It's entertaining, but you're going to learn something. And case in point, I'm listening to a founder of a, of a niche and I can't remember, but some niche cosmetic uh, company. And so to be blunt, that's not something I'm overly interested in, but I always know I can learn something. And case in point, she said one thing about hitting the mass market, getting your brand out there. And I think she had wrote a book or did something. And her point was, I just want people to be exposed to this. And it's just a stream of consciousness. I just started thinking about things. And I thought, well, Pickleball is kind of in the area that she was talking about where by most measures, you could still call it a niche, but it's kind of at that tipping point, right? It's at that cusp. It's just about really to go mainstream. I think from a awareness standpoint, most people in America have heard it. Still, the mo- most amount of people couldn't define what it is or tell you any specifics, but it's getting close. I thought about what other shows have done for different brands, different industries, Um, there's some obvious ones that people are thinking about right now. And I just thought, you know, pickleball should have something like that. And as soon as the thought came into my head, it was a slap in my head to myself. (laughs) If this can be done, why not you be the one to do it? And back to the question, well, what if we did, what would that look like? What would it take? How would that work? And that was really the the genesis of the idea for Amazing. Pickleball. Yes. I listen to a lot of podcasts too, including uh, How I Built This is one of my favorite about entrepreneurship, um, which is really inspiring. And it's it's funny now after all these years, I, tend, I know some of them, which is crazy. So maybe you'll be on that show too. So, okay. So you've got this idea, but again, you don't have to take on everything. You chose, you thought, you know, you could do typical advertising. You can, there's all kinds of, you know, more traditional channels. A reality show is unique and also time consuming. So, you know, that's sort of another thing to add on to your time. (laughs) So what's next with it? You know, have you started planning? I I think I read that you already have selected all the uh, contestants. Crystal, you know, you sound a little like my wife in a sense of you know, slow down. You know, where's the fire? Let's kind of enjoy where we're at. And honestly, I want to, and I try to, but I just feel this compulsion to move forward. Uh, ironically, we're talking right now. It's uh, it's a Monday. We start shooting this Saturday. So yes, we uh, we put out sort of a national casting call. Here's the crazy thing, Crystal. We said number one, you need to be a elite player. So we had all these things in there to let people know, look, if you're the best guy among your 12 friends, this show's probably not for you. This is where you have to be like, I'm one step away from playing professionally. 
So again, not the best guy in the court, not even the best guy in, in that court all the time. It's the best guy in your city. How do you know that? Or how do they know that? How do they, how can they, you know, is that using a duper rating or USTR rating? Like, you know, what were your criteria? Pickleball right now, it's still the wild West, right? There's no one NFL. There's no dominant uh, regulatory body. We just put it out there that we're looking to crown uh, one man, one woman to form a mixed pair to play on the pro tour. So again, this isn't like, oh, I enjoy it. You know, I'm trying to work my way up and can you please pick me? It's not a developmental thing. It's they're playing at the professional level. They just don't have the financial resources to actually be there enough. You know, you get better when you play with the best. So the people who are sponsored keep getting better because they keep playing against the best people. But then you got this whole crop of players, Crystal, that are really at that level. The problem is they can only travel to a tournament maybe once every other month. So they're not sharpening their sword enough. Then they go home and they dominate, strokes their ego, but they're not getting better. And so those were the people we're looking for, had hundreds of entries. To put that in perspective, we had 93 entries on the last day alone. And this isn't a just, oh, on the spur of the moment, they filled out an application. This was fill out an application, agree to this gigantic waiver, and make four videos that they had to submit to us. So it's a pretty heavy application. And yet we had a ton of people. So really high level players. Then we had the ability to sort through them, look at backstory. We got some really interesting people that uh, I think America and the world is going to enjoy watching. So that's a good question. Are they all US based or did you open this up globally? We really focused on America. We ended up getting a ton from North America. So uh, we had a whole bunch of countries, some even from Europe and Japan, but uh, those were small, like single digit numbers. So 95% came from the United States, maybe about 5% from Canada. So we ended up out of the 16, we selected 15 from uh, the United States and one from Canada. Gotcha. Gotcha. And how did you know that was a problem? I mean, had you, had you met some potential pros and they said like, Hey Ace, I wish I could do this, but I, you know, I can't, I can't make it. I can't travel. Yeah. That it's not a, not a secret, you know, that if you meet high level players, that's absolutely the case. And they're usually very open about it, you know, that they save up their money and they work odd jobs and try to, you know, maybe get part-time things just to save up. It's, it's sort of where, um, golf and tennis probably to some degree, but definitely was in the, in the past you could go back. I mean, you know, I watch, uh, these 30 for 30 specials on ESPN and you hear about the old NFL, you know, uh, again, we're talking 70 years ago, you know, a guy would play for the giants, you know, on the weekend and during the week he was a plumber, you know, because the money just wasn't there yet. So again, that a lot of that is starting to change literally right now, but we wanted to be part of that solution to make dreams come true. And if I had to say in one word, Crystal, this show is about dreams. And so we're making four dreams come true, two pro contracts and two franchises that we're awarding. So let's talk about that. We talked about the pros. Why, why offer a franchise? Because again, you know, back to, it takes someone like you, it takes someone, um, very ambitious, um, and a lot of time, a lot of energy and, you know, dedicated. And how did you know that maybe this was something that you wanted to offer beyond those that were already coming to you? and saying they wanted to do it. As we brainstormed here within the team and we were talking about what we could do and how could we make it an impact? How can we help the pickleball community that is so gracious, that is so warm and welcoming, but it's still fledgling, it's just starting. Well, there's a shortage of courts. I don't care where you live, what city, what state, you are dealing with the same problem. And I, I talked to them, they're like, hey, so you have no idea. Here in Cleveland, Ohio, here in you know uh, Wisconsin, any state you want to throw out, any city, it's not a unique problem. That problem exists everywhere. So we need more courts. And ideally, we need indoor courts so people don't have to deal with the weather problem. So that's an issue. But I know what a blessing it is to have your sport, whether primarily or at least secondarily, be the business of pickleball. And for most people, I'm going to be blunt, it's the barrier to entry is just too high. 
they just aren't going to be able to get there on their own. So again, trying to be a blessing to the community, we thought here's a way that we're going to be able to help people to do something they may or may not be able to do on their own. And then to go with that, to hold their hand. So it's not like, hey, congratulations, you got a franchise, now go, go sick them. You know, uh, with that, we're literally going to usher them in, kind of really consult uh, as much as we need to, to get them up and running. And there's a whole kind of plan behind that. But um, I tell you, that prize in and of itself could not only be life changing, it could be leading to generational wealth, you know, for that person's family. That's really amazing. And I I mean, you're definitely on, I mean, I I obviously wouldn't have started this podcast if I didn't think there was going to be growing interest, but I think what you're getting at really does speak to the spirit of pickleball. And there was an article that said, you know, will pickleball save America? And it was joking because, but, but I think that person must have really, that author must have understood that it goes so far beyond a sport and it is so welcoming. And there, there are a lot of business opportunities and we, we do need more business opportunities. So I think that's pretty amazing. So, okay. So the reality show, how will people watch it? Do you, do you have a plan for that? When, when do you think that it'll be live? Um, obviously after this episode, I'm sure there'll be people interested and where can they sit on a waiting list to know you know, hopefully I'll, I'll do another episode with you, but in the meantime, <laughs> right. I would love for them to follow our journey, Crystal. So they can go to uh, number one, our, our website. So we have our, uh, company website, pickleballkingdom.com specifically for the show. So that's a separate entity that's pickleball paddle battle. Dot TV. So not dot com. Pickleball Paddle Battle dot TV. So they can go there to see updates, uh, when the show is going to be released, where it's going to be released. We're currently in conversations with different distributors. So those announcements will, will come. We're looking at probably, we got some soft dates. So I'm just going to say we're looking around November okay. to have the show distributed where they can actually see it. We also follow all our social media handles at Pickleball Kingdom and at Pickleball paddle battle. So a lot of people watching this or listening to this will be wishing that there was one in their city and a couple of things, you know, feel free to mention, which is, should they get in touch with you? Do you have bandwidth for more franchises right now? You know, what if, what if I want to open one? <laughs> well, Crystal, then we need to talk. So you understand what I just heard. We're a steakhouse and you're like, what if someone wants a steak? Could they come over? <laughs> We'll make a table right now. So the answer is yes to all of the above. Uh, that's what we do. So um, we are, we formed a production company to do this show. And this is the first season. I see this really having a life of its own. And we already have some plans for maybe some spinoff things. But at the end of the day and at the core, we are a franchising business to expand our band first bandwidth, first throughout the United States and then the world. So uh, they could just literally go to our website, pick up kingdom.com there's a franchising tab and then hit connect with us and that'll send the direct message to our coo rob street who's in charge of franchising so he'll get that input form make contact with the person and we'll kind of start the process from there and you mentioned beyond the u.s um i know pickleball has grown and, and is getting some notoriety in other countries. What's your experience been with other countries or what's your vision for sort of handle the U S and then expand? Or are you already looking beyond our borders? Yeah. Like everything that's happening in pickleball crystal, it's just so many balls in the air, you know, at the same time. So we're not actively looking in other countries. I will tell you, we've had conversations about several different countries already because it's coming to us. So we will take those calls. We'll have those conversations, but the temperature definitely has to be right. And there's some key elements that we're looking for to be able to pull that trigger early because it would be early to go international. We're not opposed to it, but the stars do have to line up. So if they do, we will. But if they don't, um, you know, there's so much business to do right here in the U.S., we're going to focus there. That's amazing. Uh, do you think that pickleball will, 
I mean, you know, everyone thinks that it's at the beginning and, and I, I, I sort of agree with that, but do you think it's going to move into younger generations? And do you think, do you see that already? Like who, who's, who is the typical person coming to your location right now? Yeah. If you just look at the national statistics, literally two years ago, the average age of a pickleball player was about 48 years old and it was still a little top heavy, right? The retired community still kind of dominated. And then you had some middle-aged people. So it average right there. The last statistic I heard blew me away. In literally just a couple of years, it's now down to 35-ish. Uh, and that's because there's youth now playing as well. So it warms my heart, you know, on a daily basis at the kingdom, I'll see three generations playing on a court together. So you got a guy like me with his kid and his father or mother playing. You know, it's, again, nothing like it that's active. You see that in golf, but golf's not really an active sport. This is something that there's a cardiovascular workout. I want to throw this in. I kind of coined this phrase. Pickleball is a uh, sneaky workout. And I say that because, you know, just last night I was on an elliptical and every second I'm on there, I'm just like, how much longer? This is torture. I hate this. But I'm listening to a podcast. That's the only thing that gets me through. Yay. But if you play pickleball, like I'll play later tonight and I'll play for an hour, hour and a half. Never once do I think I'm working out. I'm laughing, talking trash, having a good time. And when I'm done, my sweat ring will be down to my belly button. So I got a great workout, but never realizing I am and just having fun. I, you know, you're right. I know Apple Watch has like a pickleball setting and and every once in a while, my friends and I are like, wow, that was a lot more. And, and also I think people don't want to stop playing until they are so fatigued. They if, if they have time to play in that one more game, they will. And I do think you're solving a big problem. And I, I feel really passionately about the problem, not just like, oh, people should have a place to play. But I think cities have not caught up or caught on to how positive this is. And so there's always this tension between tennis and pickleball, and that does not need to exist. Um, I, I think they're very different sports. They attract different people. They have a different air about them. Tennis typically was or used to be a, a country club sport, just like golf. And even though there's public courts, you know, you, you, have, you know, you see two people playing against each other on a court that can hold four pickleball courts with four people each. So it, it, which is different. And even what the specifics of what you're talking about, um, which I'd love to hear a little bit more, you know, the way you operate internally, right? Like as a pickleball player, you can go to a court alone and find people to play with. That's harder to do. It's rare. You'd find a pickup tennis game or a pickup well, you know, pick up basketball maybe, but not really golf. Yeah. I mean, you're hitting on a lot of key points, Crystal. I would put tennis in a category with golf that the learning curve is very steep. I wasn't going to pick up golf until our youngest child, our daughter was out of the house because both our kids were very involved with sports and I just knew I wouldn't get that time back. So I held off. Well, she just graduated from GCU, Grand Canyon University, a handful of months ago. So when she first went to school four years ago, it's like, okay, green light, you know, got the time, uh, got brand new clubs, took lessons, hours and hours on the driving range. And I uh, haven't played golf in probably a good year and a half. But when I would go out and keep in mind, I'm just point of reference, former division one quarterback, just to say, I got good hand-eye coordination. And I'd go out there sometimes and feel like I never touched a golf club in my life. You know, there's so many variables. It's so difficult. And I'd always leave the house excited to play and come home pretty pissed off. You know, frustrated. Yeah. exactly. Where pickleball it's I'll play with my wife and other couples and I'm playing at a different level and I'm having a great time. I'm having a blast. Tonight, I'm playing with a couple of guys I play with regularly, and we play all out. We're trying to hit each other with the ball as much as we can and having a great time. So you can play intensely, casually. You're still going to enjoy it. You're still going to get that workout. You're still going to get that social connection that doesn't exist most other places. 
And I think that social connection is really what, you know, back to that article about saving America. I, I think there's something that, you know, I know as people get older, they often feel invisible and, um, you know, that, and, and when they're young, they're getting a lot of attention and something about on the pickleball court, when you have someone in their seventies or eighties and someone who's, you know, 14 and they're completely connecting and making eye contact and playing together. So, so do you have a structure in your um, location that people can come and, and do pick? up or do you have to reserve? Is it, do you have both things? When you walk into the kingdom, or actually, if you just go to our website, pickleballkingdom.com, you're going to see our five belief statements. And our first belief statement is, we believe life is better with pickleball. And then we say that pickleball is good for you physically, socially, and spiritually. And we don't mean that as a joke or a hyperbole. We mean that literally. And we have several people in our facility that have literally told me, and these are adults, that said, Ace, I'm going to be honest, I didn't have a lot of friends. But now that I come here, I have my community, I have my tribe, I have my people that I can play with, a place to belong, and it's changed everything. People at Pickleball Kingdom, if you've lost 30, 40 pounds, not that big of a deal because we got people literally 50 to one guy, 70 pounds. Wow. Strictly from playing pickleball, Crystal, not from being on an elliptical and other stuff. And he said he tried to eat a little better, but it wasn't like this radical diet. It was from being sedentary, you know, just he's not an athlete and he makes no bones about that. But he said, I've never played sports, saw this as something I could try, tried it, enjoyed it, kept getting more and more into it, took lessons, got a little better. It's the upward spiral versus most people downward spiral. That is such a good point. Oh, I love the way you just said that. We build community by having drop in play. It's really like pickup basketball, right? You can go to almost any court and say, Hey, you got five. Can I run with you guys? So in our case, we have these hooks on the wall. You just put your paddle, you're in the next game. So no awkward, hey, is it okay if I play with you guys? You know, just kind of weird and you feel a little awkward. It's no, that's the way the system is. And then we got other racks. That's the next game, next game. So you don't have to have someone else. And just to finish that one point earlier, the week before we opened the club, uh, we were having some soft launch events and I was there one night. It was pretty late. The club was actually closed, but I was just moving some things around. And I saw a woman kind of peering through the front glass window. So I came, I opened the door and... I said, hey, do you want to see inside? So she's like, oh, well, if you're close, I said, no, that's fine. So I'll give her a quick tour. And um, literally one of the people that I kind of mentioned, and her name's not Mary, so I'm just going to call her Mary for the point of our story. So as we're walking out, um, she said, so how does this work? Is it a membership? I said, yes, yeah, a membership that you can pay, come as much as you want, or you can just you know pay as a visitor fee. And she said, well, you know, I saw this online. I'm excited about it. But she said, Ace, I'm going to be honest. And she got a little teary eyed and she said, I don't really have friends and everything I see online, you play with four people. I don't think I can get three other people to come play with me. And, you know, it made me a little choked up. I had to take a breath. And I said, Hey, Mary, don't worry about it. We got this thing we're going to do. You can come by yourself, but you come 10 hours a day. 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. or 11 to 2 in the afternoon or six, uh, 5 to 8 p.m. And those are these drop-in plays where you come and just put your paddle. So you can be by yourself. You put your paddle. Whoever else puts their paddle, though, that's the next game. If three people put their paddle, the existing game, one, uh, three people come off, one person stays on, that's the four. If four people put their paddle, the next four goes on. So she starts doing that. Now she comes almost every day. And it's like cheers where they say norm. I see her walking in and people are like, Mary, you know, she's got this group of friends she plays with on Tuesdays, that group she plays with Wednesday. And she's got a smile on her face. Uh, two other guys, one employee that works with us uh, literally said, Ace, this changed my life. I was in a state of depression, yada, yada, yada. What a lot of people in America are going through today here. This is the best place to work. And the, I, when I'm not working, I'm here playing and I love it. So we, again, build that community through the kingdom. I think that's so amazing. And I, I, I agree. I sort of want to underline this, this element that I almost, be, I think non-believers or non-players don't understand how 
isolated uh, Americans and others were feeling. I, you know, I'm sure in other countries as well. And th- this really is part of the solution. And then on a business front, there, you know, there were businesses that were going away. There were venture capitalists deciding that they didn't want to continue to fund certain businesses. There were businesses that couldn't make it through COVID. And all of a sudden, there's a whole sort of sense of, you know, new activity, new business on, on both fronts. That's, I think that's what's so interesting to me and what, what you've, you're sort of combining both things, right? You saw it as a business opportunity and also very personally. Um, well, I, you know, I, I'm just excited about what comes next and the reality show. And, um, you know, I wish that I lived closer to one of the kingdoms. I hope you'll think about California. I know we're a tough state, but uh, everyone says, well, it's so expensive in certain areas to find land, but, but we have a big state. So please make sure you look in California. (laughs) We're having conversations with people in California as we speak, Crystal, but uh, if you and I need to talk offline, let me know. (laughs) No, that's fantastic. And and I do, Ace, I just really appreciate what you're doing. And like I said, I I don't think you probably didn't need to do this in your lifetime, but you've chosen to do it and you're taking it on. And I'm really excited to see what aces you have up your sleeve. I hope you'll, you'll come back and and keep us posted and we're looking to look at the show and I'll put all the links in the show notes, but if there's anywhere else they should go that you haven't mentioned, please, please let me know. Um, it's pickleballkingdom.com and pickleballpaddlebattle.tv. There you go. (laughs) Okay. Not not to make this the mutual admiration society, Chris, but congratulations on your podcast, what you're doing, Kudos to you and uh, best of luck. I think you're absolutely on the right trajectory here. Thank you uh, so much for your time. And everybody, subscribe, like, um, follow us, follow Pickleball Kingdom. Uh, Make sure you see what's coming next. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to Simply Pickleball. We will be back very soon with great interviews, discussions, and more all about pickleball. Don't forget to subscribe to our channels on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, or any of your favorite podcasting outlets. Until next time. Happy dinking.